these functions and positions. Uh, and he's talked about word combination. Right, so this is a bad title, right, because uh, um, it should say something like this, which was the original title, but from, uh, uh, for most of uh, the language models that we work with in uh, uh, deep learning these days, <coughs> We, uh, we throw out the interesting parts uh, of language. Um, okay, so I'm gonna start off with a couple of uh, statistical facts about language. I often get up and give these talks and I say, oh, there are all these things we know about language that linguists tell us and then I show trees and like the machine learning people kind of go to sleep. Um, so today I'm gonna talk about statistical facts, things that you can go out and you can look at a lot of data and just can't really argue with this. So this is Zith's law. This has been known since the 30s, uh, at least uh, that, um, Basically, a rare word, there's sort of basically a power law distribution of frequencies in all natural languages. And uh, another way of saying this is rare types are extremely common. And so uh, when you uh, unkify your corpus and throw away sort of rare words and replace them with this meaningless symbol, uh, you're throwing away a lot of the distribution. And that's not, that's probably not a good idea. Um, it depends, people have different heuristics, uh, you know. Uh, I would say as we've gone to deep learning more and more, uh, people tend to be more aggressive. It used to be you'd throw out singletons, now you throw out things that occur less than you know, five times even in a million word corpus or something like that. Um, so another uh, way of stating this is sometimes called Heap's Law. Uh, this is from the information retrieval community uh, and it basically shows that in any corpus as you add more and more documents to it, you're gonna see more and more unique uh, types. And both of these are sort of their nice uh, uh, simple uh, curves that characterize these things. Um, and so the lesson I'm gonna take away from that is uh, you cannot model language and close the vocabulary. Um, you can model something language-ish, but uh, probably uh, you're, you're you're also missing this. These, these are really robust, important aspects uh, of language. So uh, a bunch of work that uh, my group has done uh, over the last few years has um, said, well, can we, uh, you know, without sort of going and solving all of AI, can we do something better with language than throwing out uh, sort of the interesting parts uh, of the distribution? Um, so I'm gonna talk about two parts of this work. Um, so the first is uh, building representations of words compositionally. So we're gonna find smaller bits of words, uh, hint characters uh, and morphemes. Uh, and then we'll talk about uh, dealing with uh, some of uh, some more uh, specific statistical problems uh, with a word reuse model uh, to get a better uh, language model. So, what, yeah. what does that do with the unknown? Um, so, uh, the idea is we're going to find smaller pieces. There are only 26 letters in English. Uh, that's in English orthography, but in uh, spoken English, there are a fixed set of phones and uh, uh, phonemes that are used to encode the words. Uh, and so that actually is closed. Uh, so the idea is we're going to represent these big complex words as a function of uh, uh, these little uh, pieces that are closed. Um, which is you know, how, we, how we usually do these things. But you should say, that's crazy because words, you know, how can you know what, just looking at a new word, you can't tell what it means. Uh, linguists even observe this. Uh, this is sometimes, for pointing out the obvious, this is one of the reasons linguists sometimes have a bad reputation. Um, so uh, Saussure called uh, this phenomenon of basically uh, there being no relationship be between the way a word looks and what it means, arbitrariness. So you can see this if you have the word car, you subtract a C and add a B, you get bar and it means you know, something else. If you do the same thing starting with cat, uh, that transformation you know, is completely different. So that whole parallelogram uh, analogy that we heard about uh, earlier in this week, that certainly uh, isn't, uh, you're not gonna find analogies, uh, or at least linear analogies here. Um, another way we see arbitrariness is uh, if we look across languages. So we take a concept like car, which is historically relatively recent. We might think it was invented once and everybody got the same word, but we look at a bunch of different languages and we find they all picked a completely different word uh, for this. So, uh, you know, even when there would be a historical reason to have some kind of uh, relation between these words, we don't see it. Um, at the other end uh, of the spectrum, we've got compositionality though. Um, and so this is basically the idea that you can look at uh, the meaning of an expression as a, uh, 
uh, composition of the meanings of component parts, uh, and then the rules that were used to put them together. Uh, and this is usually ascribed to Frege, but I was recently reading that Frege actually um, didn't, really, uh, didn't really invent this. It goes back to Plato. Um, and Frege, of course, didn't even talk about it. Um, so, <laughs> uh, just one of those sort of historical folk uh, uh, traditions. So, this idea is really simple. So, you've got something like the sentence, John dances. It's got some kind of semantics, uh, like written below. We make a transformation of John to Mary, uh, and we have this. Uh, and now, if we take a similar sentence where John's singing, uh, do the same transformation, we see that there's a, uh, a, a similar transparent change. Uh, in the semantics. Um, and so, you know, really what we've got in language learning then uh, is, you know, it seems like up at the lexical level, we've got arbitrariness, and we've got down at the you sort of propositional level, uh, we've got compositionality. That's been, that was Saussure's story, and that's been kind of what we uh, all start with. Um, and of course, you know, that has, these have two uh, very different uh, learning aspects, right? I mean, here, all you've got, you can just memorize. You can't do anything if there's no relationship. You've just got to learn, memorize it. Uh, and otherwise, we can generalize in some interesting way. Um, of course, I wouldn't be here uh, if things weren't quite, uh, the, if things were that uh, sort of simple, uh, we have some challenges here. So first, we have idioms. I'm not going to say much about idioms because these are at the propositional level. I'm talking more at the uh, word level uh, during this talk. Uh, but basically, here uh, we'll change this predicate, and we no longer get the uh, nice transformation uh, that we got um, uh, prior to this. So uh, John kick the bucket means something uh, particular. So that meaning has to, in some sense, it's arbitrary. Um, on the other hand, we've got morphology. Uh, so in English, we don't typically think that we have a lot of word formation processes that go on that we could be modeling, uh, but in fact, we do. So uh, if you go on social media, you know, I'd argue this is a kind of morphology. Like, you know, I don't think people over in the linguistics department would necessarily call it that, but uh, why not? Um, but then we've got more classical kinds of morphology where we add an S to the end of a word uh, that says, oh, this thing is plural. Um, and if we do that to sort of any word, uh, we get the same uh, pattern of, uh, of meanings. Um, and we know that, uh, for example, this is a very productive process. You can teach a kid a new word, uh, and it will uh, be able to generalize uh, and produce the right form when uh, context calls for it to produce something that would have a plural semantics. Um, so you know, there's a little bit of uh, compositionality we might be able to exploit here. Um, so when learning uh, linguistic representation, uh, basically these are these two kind of extremes that a learner has to contend with. Um, and I'd say although we do see more arbitrariness at the level of individual words, uh, we really do see kind of this uh, gradation between, we see arbitrariness at the level of sentences and we see compositionality at the level of words. And so really we need learners that uh, can, can be flexible and sort of move between these two extremes easily. Um, and uh, in general, what we've been doing in this work is taking LSTMs, which are nominally a model, which read in multiple things and then put them together in some way, and we, which we usually have claimed are good for generalization, uh, and we're going to use them to uh, also force them to memorize, basically. And uh, the interesting thing, of course, is that if you look at where uh, deep learning models often fail, it's because they tend to memorize a little bit too much which it's a little bit hard for them to, uh, um, to make the necessary abstractions that they, that they ought to be. Um, very briefly, I just want to mention that. I mean at the lexical level meaning? So I'll, ta I'll talk about, the, mo I'll talk about the, uh, the, the one of the uses here in just one second. But basically, we're going to be reading characters uh, and then building word representations out of those. Um, I'm also just going to mention, you know, uh, we've had a 
we've never been really great about working on languages other than English in, uh, uh, in NLP, uh, but uh, it's sort of gotten particularly bad maybe now that we think we might be able to do some really interesting uh, uh, NLP uh, with deep learning. Uh, but there's really, languages work very differently. Uh, even just looking at the lexical level, you can talk about the complexity uh, of different languages and they, uh, with the complexity of the words they use. And uh, we can have a typology uh, of languages. And so words in languages like English or Mandarin, Chinese are, are pretty atomic and they refer to single concepts. Um, but as we go to these sort of down, we get increasingly complex words. And so, you know, in a agglutinative language like Turkish, you might have a single word form uh, that means something like they caused it not to meow or something like that. Uh, and then there are these uh, even more uh, complex languages um, called polysynthetic languages, which can kind of contain full propositions and single words, but there aren't very Wait, many of those. That's a single word? That could be something like this would be a single word and like uh, inictitut, apparently, I don't speak. The thing is not very, there are very few speakers of these languages left, they're fairly rare, and so there's some controversy. And, and it's not like German where it's <coughs> It, uh, it is. It's, uh, so there are pieces that fit together, but they behave differently than words in a sentence do. There are, uh, there are diagnostics, um, some of which are controversial, but uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of like German. Um, okay, so here's, here's going to be uh, the model that we're going to start with. So the, sta the simplest memorization model is what we use all the time, I would argue, in uh, modeling language with, uh, uh, in deep learning. So we take a word and we project it into uh, a one-hot vector. Every dimension corresponds to uh, you know, one position uh, in the vocabulary. Um, of course, this is fixed, um, fixed-sized embedding, and then we project this down uh, into to some low dimensional space. And we learn this projection. And so this projection matrix that we'll left multiply by uh, is going to, or right multiply, I guess, since this is a row vector, um, is going to have uh, a vector for every word uh, in this, uh, um, uh, in the language. And so each of those parameters are going to be independent. Related words are just going to be as you know, independ independently parameterized as words that are very similar. So cat and cats will be, have the, each have their own parameters just like cat and generalize will. Um, so uh, on the other side, we're gonna work with this generalization model, which uh, when we actually proposed this, we s didn't really think this was sensible. Um, and so I'm still sort of surprised when it works. We're gonna view, uh, car as a sequence, C-A-R, uh, and we will embed this, uh, each of those characters, uh, and we're gonna assume there's a, a fixed number of these, which is a more reasonable assumption, uh, and then we'll read this with a bidirectional uh, LSTM. I wasn't here on Monday for Chris's talk, but uh, apparently uh, he informed you all that bidirectional LSTMs are what you need for basically every problem in NLP these days. This is yet another example. Uh, we'll combine these uh, to get a vector representation uh, in exactly the same space. So the difference is um, you can think about this as having this big learned matrix living on this arrow, um, and and uh, this is parameterizing this matrix using this uh, RNN. The difference is um, this can take any sequence in, um, and so we, we get uh, um, sort of uh, an effectively infinite matrix there. Um, okay, so, and we're going to, in both of these cases, we're gonna train these parameters or the parameters that, uh, of this matrix or the parameters that live inside this bidirectional RNN uh, using back, pro back propagation from some task that's consuming uh, these word vectors. So these could be things like modeling sequences of words. They could be things like translation or text classification. Um, I am going to uh, talk about uh, dependency parsing. Uh, I had a postdoc who was really into this. Uh, Noah talked about this on Wednesday, so you guys are all experts. Uh, and so the ideas will be given sentences like this, and we'll predict this uh, uh, rooted uh, tree uh, here. And the way we're gonna do this is we're just, we've got uh, two parsers, 
and we are going to uh, compare two different ways of representing the inputs. One is just gonna be these word lookup tables, uh, and the other is going to be using these character uh, bidirectional LSTMs. Sorry, what's the desired output? Uh, the desired output, so we are uh, uh, building this tree up with a sequence of actions uh, that using actually a shift reduce parser uh, to build that. So this is uh, very similar to the uh, model that, uh, that Noah talked about on Wednesday. We're going to uh, either alternate between, uh, um, between shifting words off of the sentence and into a, and into a stack or combining elements on the stack to build little treelets. And this process will terminate when there's only one thing left on the stack uh, and that's a tree. And when we combine two things, we you know, put a link between, uh, between the two of them. And the links are saying who did the ducking and who did the scene. Yeah, exactly. That's saying I am roughly, it points to its argument. So you can think about these words. So predicates or verbs have uh, the subject and object as their uh, arguments. Uh, uh, or nouns have uh, their modifiers to so things like adjectives and possessive pronouns and things like that. Um, there, this uh, dependency. Why is the saw going to duck and not to her? Uh, so this is a linguistic convention. Uh, there are some reasons that uh, linguists have uh, argued that uh, in most cases the main verb of the sentence is the root of the sentence. Uh, the directedness is just. Uh, it makes this work out as a tree, uh, so with a single root. Um, so things point at their arguments rather than the other way around. Um, if it's more convenient conceptually to think the other way around, you can reverse the arrows, but this gives you a tree. Well, I mean, her is the, is the object of C, not that. Um, no, oh, in this, uh, yeah, that's, no, there's amb ambiguity here. That's why I picked this sentence. So in one, one reading of the sentence says she has a duck, and in the other case, I saw her ducking under the, and in that case, you saw her. Um, so yeah, there, oh, you, you got the other reading. Okay, you're, I think you're the first person to ever actually get the confusion, uh, and that was why I picked this example. Um, so, okay, yeah, no, 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 this is, yeah, your mind works differently, that's great. Um, right, so the, the, yeah, that's the, that's the confusion. Um, so these are somewhere between kind of a semantic and a syntactic uh, analysis, uh, and uh, it's a little more oriented to some syntactic uh, conventions. Um, all right, so basically the idea is we're just going to replace the first level of this network that's driving this parser, the representations. We'll either have uh, lookups that uh, come from a table where every word gets its own set of parameters, or we're going to have the single network and we're going to be computing this vector representation uh, as a function of the sequence of characters. Two cases are in the same dimension. Same, same dimension, exactly, yeah. Um, and yeah, we picked something sort of reasonable for the internal architecture. Yeah. I just have a question. So even before you use these representations in anything, did you actually look at if you make small orthographic changes? Uh, um, where, where, where you get a big semantic difference in the word, but it's a small orthographic. I, mean, I guess like for example, if you change a B to a C, some words might change completely in meaning, but other words might not. And is it the case that the second model does a better job of understanding the context in which the small orthographic change occurs in? So I will. Ta I do have some examples uh, later in the talk showing getting at this. We have. We have done a fair amount of analysis of what these things are learning. Um, there's also a little bit of controversy about the relationship between uh, uh, like the form of words and the uh, semantics. There is uh, recently, or this claim periodically comes up that Saussure was sort of overly pessimistic and actually languages abound in these things where there are relationships between sound and meaning. Sometimes they'll call these things like, um, uh, uh, what grapho semantic? Uh, yeah. If you make a, one character change yeah. to the string, do you find that in certain words that one character change makes a drastic difference yes. to the representation, while as in other words that same one character change makes practically no difference? Uh, we okay, okay. right. We we haven't we haven't looked at pr done precisely that test, but uh, I think the evidence will show later suggests that that is happening. I mean that's what these nonlinear models give you in in the potential of learning. Yeah, that yeah, that's certainly. Um, yeah, thanks, great question. Um, okay, so we'll, we'll look um, uh, at a, yeah. Can you explain that slide you just left? I guess this architecture of your, I don't understand this two layer. 
Oh, the two-layer thing, yes, uh, sorry. Um, the idea is um, you can read a sequence from left to right or you can read it from right to left. And uh, um, it's often the case that uh, um, that reading it in both directions and combining the representations uh, makes the learning problem a little bit easier. So uh, in particular for this task, it actually seems a little bit sensible. So in a lot of the languages we're going to look at, the kind of syntactically interesting parts of the words tend to be suffixes or they tend to be prefixes. And so you're going to have gradients impinging on that position in the word uh, a little bit more directly than if you were uh, always had to get to the prefix by traversing the entire word. Um, it wouldn't, in principle, it doesn't matter. Uh, this is just a sort of conventional way of, uh, if you want a single encoding of a sequence, you can read it from left to right or from right to left, uh, and it's a little bit easier to uh, do the combination. Yeah? Um, just like a slightly technical question. Have you ever tried um, doing embeddings of characters directly and then doing an LSTM on top, and has that helped? Or do you just go from one hot encoding to LSTM? Oh, sorry, there are, these are embedded in some low dimensional space, yeah. Okay, and that dimensional, like, is it, Different dimensionality than you would choose for words generally. Oh yeah, yeah. It's it's a, it's a lot smaller. You just don't need that many contrasts. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we didn't try ever scaling up really big, but it seemed to plateau fairly quickly. But um, yeah, great question. Yeah, please. Yeah. Again, this is inspired by the way humans read. I'm no, this isn't. This is. I, yeah. Okay. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Question is inspired. Oh, I see. I see. So. Normally, when you're reading a book and there's a word you don't know, you go to the dictionary, or if it's a Kindle, you just hover on it and it pops up the definition. Yeah. And then that definition gives you some sort of representation. And it seems like the unk problem could perhaps be done by just having a very nice dictionary. Yeah. Combining synonyms, especially ones that you know, to come up with representation there whenever you encounter an unknown word. And it's most, most I mean, dictionaries are pretty complete. I mean, dictionaries have. Some dictionaries have 500,000 words, and it's very rare to find words outside of the, some dictionary. No, I was going to say, wait till you work on Twitter. We actually started doing this because my student was going to translate social media content, and uh, we were sick of trying to normalize the content before we translated it. Yeah, there are a lot of online dictionaries that are there, there, we found 5,000 different ways of spelling the word wood, as in the you know, modal verb. And so, yeah, I think uh, even Urban Dictionary has its limits. Um, so uh, yeah, that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, and I will come back to that, because obviously, this is not going to give you, if you, there are honest, if I say the, you know, the word gorp or something like that and have a particular idea in mind, you have no idea what I'm talking about, really. Um, and, and, there's, and a dictionary could potentially tell you that. Um, yes, in general, you need models that know what they know and know what they don't know. And uh, they either, and when they see a word they don't know, they might guess some properties about it. So in syntax, if you know, you know, if this looks like a noun or it's in the position where a verb is going to be, you can probably solve this task. If you're trying to do something like translation, well, you're really out of luck if you don't know it. So it depends a lot on the task. Um, and uh, in general, yeah, you have to go and find out the meaning. And looking at a dictionary, which provides very rich, informative context about the meaning of a word, is one thing. But another thing to do is go out to the web and find you know, a thousand instances where this word was used and try and infer its meaning by reading all of those. So, like using Urban Dictionary followed by context and spelling checkers might be an odd yeah, let's. I, I want to go on. Otherwise, we're uh, we're not going to get far. But these are great questions. Um, okay. So the the first thing to notice is that in English. Uh, we actually didn't find that this model got any worse. We thought it would. It's a silly model in a lot of ways. Um, and uh, so this really shows that LSTMs are able to learn these uh, uh, you know, these very uh, sort of arbitrary relationships between the forms of words uh, and their meanings. Um, or it just shows that uh, you don't really need to know very much about the meanings of words to do parsing. Yeah. What is the number representing? Oh, sorry. Yeah. These are, uh, this is what's called uh, labeled attachment accuracy, which is basically when you build that tree, the number of words who have picked out the right parent. So we're saying we got 91.2% or 91.5% uh, correct. So basically, these are exactly the same. So in this case, the, L the chart LSTM could be remembering the things that you've already seen and then add to uh, it. 
Absolutely infected, and that's what we would want it to really be able to do. Um, the question is, we want to smooth the long tail in kind of a sensible way and see if it can learn to make generalizations about these rarer forms as well. Um, but yes, in fact, it certainly is. And you could think of creating some really interesting adversarial examples with models like this, so we should, we should talk. Um, <laughs> um, OK, so in English, things are about the same. Um, but what about languages like this? So these uh, you know, agglutinative languages I kind of alluded to where you can have whole, whole kind of clauses uh, in, your, uh, in your word. I mean, these are actual words, apparent, like nobody's ever said those aren't words uh, to me when I've given this talk. Um, <clears throat> if we look at the performance in those languages, uh, and these are just sort of conventions that linguists label these languages as being of this type, we see much bigger improvements uh, when we go to the character level model. Well, um, what performance we talked about here? I, I don't understand the the numbers, what do these numbers mean? Oh, that, that was the question just a second ago. That's the proportion of when you predict the apparent attachment for every word in the sentence, what proportion of the words were labeled uh, as having the right head? Yeah. Uh, you're, so I'm guessing your word representations are the same dimensionality and then whatever classifiers on top also is yes. the same? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every, the architecture is completely the same from this point above. Yeah, for those of you who were here on Wednesday, it's exactly the architecture uh, that Noah Smith was talking about. This was a series of papers we had done together. Um, OK, there's a sort of level of morphological complexity. Now you see why I bothered to show that, uh, uh, that plot uh, between agglutinative and sort of simple English and uh, sometimes called uh, fusional. And we see that the performance improvements are still there, but they're a little bit smaller. Um, and then we, to round it out, we also compared with uh, Chinese, which is actually probably even uh, more extreme than English in terms of having uh, little uh, morphology on its words. And we also found that it, uh, that it works about the same um, as, uh, as the word-based models. Um, so basically the story that we, we see here is that for syntax parsing, we're able, to, we're able to do really well just looking at sequences of characters and letting the LSTM learn these kind of idiosyncratic uh, differences using its uh, internal dynamics. Basically, we're approximating that, that embedding matrix with an LSTM. Uh, another way of looking at this is uh, based on how uh, many out of vocabulary words, so basically how many unks would we see in our test set uh, uh, <coughs> and how much did we improve? So each of these points uh, is, a, uh, uh, is a language. Um, obviously, this is n is something really small. Don't take that line too seriously. But there's definitely a trend that as we increase the test set out of vocabulary rate, uh, we see uh, more improvements. Um, so uh, that kind of makes a certain amount of sense. Um, OK, so what's being learned by this model? Um, so it's maybe questionable whether we're actually learning much beyond syntactic classes. So if you see a word ending in ly, you know it's an adverb. Adverbs attached to verbs, we'll learn that from the training data pretty quickly. We don't really need to care anything else about just what's the closest adverb and what's the, uh, and what's the verb and things like that. Um, so you know, are we really learning language? So uh, we're now going to look at a more basic task, language modeling. This is just the problem of density estimation on sentences. We want to predict sequences uh, of words. Uh, this has been a very successful uh, very successfully solved problem in, uh, with deep learning. Uh, we're basing this on, we have LSTMs, and at every time step, we are using that hidden, current hidden representation uh, to, as features to define a uh, probability distribution over uh, the output words. Um, and in this first uh, task that I'm going to talk about, we're going to just change the way we represent the inputs. So there are actually <laughs> still going to be unks that we are uh, doing, uh, that we're generating. Uh, up top, we'll fix that problem in a second. Um, and again, we're going to see a really similar story, which is that uh, with uh, English, we basically get the same results. Uh, with agglutinative languages, we see uh, substantial facilitation. Uh, and then uh, the fusional languages uh, are, are somewhere uh, in between. 
Um, another thing that's worth noting here, uh, and I think this is really interesting to keep in mind, uh, the number of parameters is an order of magnitude or more less uh, in these things, uh, in these uh, LSTM-based models. Um, and we should be concerned, I think, that about the wastefulness of our embedding matrices in terms of our parameter budgets. Uh, most of, in most of the models we build, everything is uh, living in these unstructured matrices. And um, I'm not gonna, I will conclude this section in a second by saying I don't think LSTMs are it, but we need to do something. There's a lot of redundancy at that level and we should be thinking about uh, more compressed representations. So um, here's another way we can ask what, these what this language model is learning. So a uh, you know, fun thing to do along the lines of you know, parallelogram uh, analogy, analogical reasoning with word vectors is to just take a word and say, what does the model think the most similar words are? And so this gives you some insight into kind of what it thinks is important for modeling language. And often you find things that have similar syntactic or similar semantic properties close by in vector space. Um, and so what we're gonna do here is we're going to uh, query uh, the mo we're gonna build an embedding for a query word, and then for all of the words in some fixed vocabulary, we just use the ones that were present in the training set, uh, and then we're going to say what are the uh, five nearest neighbors. And we see you know, some reasonable stuff. Um, you know, increased, we do get these other verbs, but there is some morphological similarity here. Uh, so maybe it's just picking up on, you know, this ED thing. Um, I think the, the John query is a little bit more interesting. Those are all names of English kings. Uh, so we're kind of making some uh, real semantic generalizations that aren't quite so obviously Wait, formal. I, I uh -huh. Like word embeddings predicting? Well, we're, this is a left to right language modeling task. This isn't a sort of, usually with word embeddings, you do this kind of pseudo likelihood thing where you're predicting the center word conditional on everything else fixed. But uh, yeah, it's roughly the same. Um, so here's the fun thing you can do. You can, your query word can be a nonce word. You know, so this can pass, or we can give it the Jabberwocky test where we give a made up word and we can see what it thinks uh, is similar. Now the words on the nearest neighbors are things from our, uh, uh, from our uh, vocabulary, so it's not gonna make things up there. Uh, but you can see uh, that uh, uh, we, we find some sort of reasonable things. And obviously this has a kind of compositional structure. Um, and my student, now my colleague, DeepMind Wang Ling, who did this work, claimed that this is a reasonable approximation for a PhD, -ing, um, <laughs> that he was involved in all of those activity. Like yeah, yeah, so uh, he, I think that was why he was particularly taken with it, so, uh, but yeah. I mean, it's, th these aren't perfect models, but it's also not, uh, um, it's, it's not completely unreasonable what's, what's popping out there. Um, so we did another test, uh, just very briefly. Um, this I thought was surprisingly cool. My colleague Brian Rutledge at the Tepper Business School had, uh, is really interested in like how color is used in advertising. And he had this data set of, of uh, two million wor name colors uh, and, and RGB values that there's a website where people can like upload their favorite colors and create them. Uh, and they do this for hours and you can comment on each other's colors and favorite your colors and it's sort of like Facebook if you like colors. Um, and uh, so it's got you know, the standard colors, but then you've also got these really sort of strange things over here. Uh, and so we were like, well, let's train a, a character level model uh, to see if we can uh, predict a color based on a color name. Uh, and so, you know, this looks just like this, except instead of building a word embedding, uh, we're producing a, a color uh, uh, patch up at the top. Um, <clears throat> and then to train this thing, we of course have to back propagate from dark red to that lighter red and measure an error. So how do we do that? So this actually actually gets to my point about psychophysics that I, when I asked Don just a second ago. So, um, 
back in the like old days, uh, psychologists spent a lot of time with, you know, worrying about things like uh, minimum perceptible differences. And color is a great problem to work on because there are just not very many dimensions you need to perfectly represent it. So we actually have very, very good models of uh, what people can perceive uh, in uh, in color space. And uh, there's something called the C Love uh, or Lab uh, color space where basically a unit distance is supposed to be perceptually uniform. Um, so we were like, oh, well, that's exactly what we want. So we trained, uh, we represented colors uh, in that space uh, and found that to be uh, useful. And then we can do cool things like, you know, predict the color of what bacon lipstick uh, would be. Um, and uh, we can also go the other direction, given a color, generate words, um, and we can actually see some things. Uh, one of the other things we did to evaluate this uh, was uh, give people what we call the color Turing test, where we said, well, the model predicts a particular color. And of course, these were held out colors not present in the training set. Uh, and then we said, um, does the true color that actually was present in this data set, uh, we actually had three different color data sets, uh, which one do you think is a more, uh, a better description? And uh, people actually like uh, our models. Um, so I don't think this is uh, the most exciting stuff, but uh, it's, uh, uh, it was a fun project. Um, okay, so concluding this like first section here, um, I think we can say morph, uh, morphology is something that's underexploited, and these LSTMs, based on the pattern of results we're seeing when we uh, look at different kinds of languages, uh, the more morphology there is, the more of a win we get. Uh, but at the same time, we don't really lose anything for using LSTMs to uh, model, uh, to build representations of, of words, so basically to represent that matrix, they are great at memorizing. Um, and this is a really robust finding. So we've um, seen lots of follow-on work uh, doing this basically, architectures like this, uh, from a whole bunch of different groups and on a whole bunch of different tasks. Um, and uh, these are robust findings. There have also been, you don't have to have an LSTM, you can use common nets, it works great. Okay, um, so now what about what about generating? You know, we we don't always want to just read language. Sometimes we want to produce it. Um, yeah, three minutes. Okay. Um, who? Right. Okay. Um, all right. Then I'm going to say um, basically we should model things as a sequence of characters, um, and um, when we do that, we actually really don't lose very much, so lower is better here. So we've gone, you know, we've lost a little bit of, uh, you know, average uh, entropy here. Um, and if we add something like a latent discovery of uh, word-like units, this is the best uh, published uh, number uh, based on characters, we get, uh, we get things better, and this is pen tree bank uh, modeling. Um, so uh, can we do better? Um, and I'm gonna say yes, we can. And I'm going to skip ahead because I have three minutes or two minutes now. Um, okay, first we need one other observation. So not only do words occur New words constantly get generated, but words tend to be repeated. Rare words tend to get, be repeated more often than they so, should. So when you make up a new word in an article, say, you don't just say it once, you tend to say it a lot. Um, and so there's this guy, Ken Church, who's been saying this uh, for 20 years, and I think this is a great title because nobody remembers who Noriega is, um, unless, you know, that's how, that really dates this paper, uh, even if you don't like, don't look at the year. Um, so he just pointed out that when you see the word Noriega once, you're much more likely to see it again a second time. In fact, almost certainly. Um, okay, so basically the idea is we're gonna use a uh, caching model, we're gonna have a mechanism, we're not just going to generate words as a sequence of characters, we're also periodically gonna say, you know what, I'm gonna go back and copy something that I just uh, generated. And this is also not an, uh, a, a new idea, it's been around a long time, last year we saw a couple neural variants of this, but nobody was dealing with open vocabulary. 
case. So people were just assuming you would sample a word from a fixed vocabulary, including unk, and then sometimes you would copy uh, that word. But the whole point is we want to have interesting things to copy, and we wanted to see if we could build good representations for these newly created words that would be amenable to letting them be copied. Um, this is also not completely new. It's not been do done with deep learning. Hierarchical Pittman neural process language models uh, instantiated this idea. In fact, I think Pittman's right here at Berkeley. Um, <clears throat> So uh, basically what we've got, let me just go through this uh, model really quickly. Um, so we've got two parts of this model. One is just a character level language model. We've got a word level LSTM that's tracking vectors. And at each time step, we're gonna feed in a representation of the previous word, but it's gonna be computed using a sequence of, of characters like we did uh, in the model we just talked about. But then rather than sampling a single word at the time, we're gonna sample a sequence of characters from a LSTM language model uh, over characters starting with this, or transformation of this as its initial state. So this is a little bit like a character language model, a word level language model that uh, spits things out, that parameterizes this distribution using an LSTM. And we're gonna add to it a cache. And so every time we generate a word, WT, we're gonna put it in the cache in an empty slot S or in the least recently used slot. Uh, and we're gonna set the key associated with that word to be whatever the hidden state of that LSTM is at that time. If it's already there, we're gonna just take an average of the current key. Um, and then basically what we've got to do is decide what's the probability of copying something from the cache. And what we're gonna do is we will attend over all of the contents of the, uh, of the cache. I'm not gonna go through the details here. Uh, and then we have to have a final decision, which is how are we going to actually produce the next word? Are we going to copy something from the cache or are we gonna generate it? And so we're gonna also condition that on the current state uh, of the LSTM. And so we can define, think of this either as a joint probability or if we assume the right independencies, we can marginalize. Uh, 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 an HMN? Um, it is not. It has no, it, uh, there's no, it's deterministic. Uh, the transitions given the, given the input uh, are deterministic from one time step to the next. So we're going to. Where do you, I'll put it. So that is conditional on the uh, current. Yeah, uh, you could think about this. There's a sense in which it's an HMM. It might be just complicated to describe as an HMM, but it is an HMM. Uh, yes, it's com but the transition dynamics are completely determined by the emission. So they're coupled in a way where we usually have stochasticity in both components, both in the transition and in the emission. Here they're coupled in a particular way that actually simplifies inference. Yeah, so yeah, you may have a more complicated uh, description of the HMM. Right. Yeah, um, this is actually simpler because I don't have to do dynamic programming to train this. So that's, uh, that's one, one nice thing. Um, okay, so we can, we can by assuming uh, the right kind of independence assumptions, uh, we can get a mixture of probability, so we marginalize that, that decision um, by Yijin. <laughs> Um, okay, so finally the, uh, the pieces, so what we're gonna do, uh, we're generating the sentence up here, the Pokemon Company International, uh, formerly Pokemon, and we're generating that word Pokemon, so we, we've got, we can copy it. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this uh, thing, we're first gonna decide what's the probability of copying something or generating something. And then we're going to decide what's the probability of copying everything I've seen in my cache, and what's the probability of generating the word Pokemon uh, from scratch. And then we're going to, uh, we'll add these two, uh, these two things together. Um, and that's gonna be the probability of our word Pokemon. Um, basically, this stuff works. Uh, it even works on closed vocabulary language models where there is nothing really for the uh, character model to do. Um, but on open vocabulary uh, tasks, uh, we do see some, uh, some fairly significant uh, results. We've got a new, oh yeah. Is it specifically not to copy is the cache limited? You yes, you, you do have a hyperparameter, what do you put in the cache? Um, you also have to have a good representation. Uh, you have to have, there's a key associated with everything in the cache, and you, you're learning the representation of the key, but it might just be easier to learn to spell words out one at a time than to learn to generate 
the, than to represent things as a good key. So in some sense, what I think we want this model to do is copy things that are sensible to be copied, but otherwise it knows just how language goes. Uh, and it figures out, okay, now I'm in the kind of context where it's good to copy something from the past. You're still, you're just minimizing cross entropy. Yeah. Yeah, well, well talk, to me in the, talk to me in the break. Um, so we have a new data set on a bunch of languages, same story everywhere. Um, there's some kind of cool analysis, so since this is probabilistic, we can get a posterior over what was used to generate each word in every position. Um, and so we can see things like uh, this interesting mix of very frequent things like a period and the word the, and then names tend to get copied uh, out of the cache. And uh, the things that don't tend to get copied, sometimes they're also kind of rare. They tend to be a little bit more basic words, but words like uh, numbers, which are very rare, but they don't numbers don't tend to get re repeated verbatim in articles. You tend to say, you know, the economy you know, grew by 12.2% in China last month, and then you don't repeat that number. You say other numbers, but not exactly that one. So this, this kind of makes sense. Um, okay. Um, there are other things, checklist models, latent variable models representing the whole intention of what you want to say that can do this. Um, I'll just go back to these sort of statistical facts we started with and conclude. Um, we can model this, we should. Don't just ignore uh, the long tail of the linguistic distribution. There's interesting stuff out there. We can do this. Okay, that's everything. <clears throat> Yeah, so I, I have a question that's also relevant to the previous talk on adversarial instances. And I was wondering, for the character-based encoding, have you tried these instances of spellings that are non-adversarial for humans, where you change each word, you can sort of keep the first and the last character of each word, and you sort of jumble the intervening words? And fluent readers have practically no difficulty reading that at, at the same pace, but I'm wondering Right, that, that's one of my favorite examples of something that this model doesn't do at all. You can train it to do that, to be insensitive to that. What is the goal of deep model? I mean, is it, is it a tend to just get something that works, or is, is the goal to try to get something that human, that's like humans? Because it, if it's not the case that these things are adversarial in the same way, then basically it's just engineering. Yeah, um, it's, uh, it's a, uh, both our goals, so we, we want, we want, I mean, I solved this, I wanted to model this as a, I mean, these are, the model, modeling a, a marginal distribution of uh, sentences is not a cognitive problem, it's a, um, it's a, there aren't very many cognitions of, uh, or theories of cognition that would say that's in there. It's an engineering task. Uh, there are things, though, uh, we can ask where these perceptual illusions come from, like scrambling the internal things uh, of words. Certainly, people don't, ever get that training data. You're not trained to do that. You, that's something about the way the uh, generalizations that our uh, you know, V1 or whatever makes when it learns to read uh, that just give us some insight into the kinds of generalizations that it makes and how reading works. Um, and we could think about building models that try and look more like that, and why we would try, then we would test them to see if they were generalizing in the same way. This was meant to solve a, a, just an engineering task, not to replicate that sort of pattern. But if you started thinking about adversarial reading, you would, want, you would be concerned with that psychophysical fact, and you could either tr try and solve that by changing the training data to have a psychophysical penalty in some sense, or you could change the architecture so its regularization or generalization behavior matched a little bit more like the human, uh, the human visual systems. So a much bigger question. Maybe we should uh, have coffee, and, uh, uh, and you can ask me questions then. Thanks very much.